There are many dangerous commands that a user could enter into a terminal and actually cause their Linux installation to crash, or in some cases, you could permanently break your Linux installation. So it's a good idea to actually share with people what some of these dangerous commands do, what they are. The most obvious one, of course, is the old sudo rm-rf on root. Now, this should be pretty obvious to most users. The rm command, of course, is a remove command. It's a delete command. You use it to delete files or directories on the system. sudo gives you root privileges, meaning you have permission to delete any file or directory on the system. Dash rf means recursively delete all files on the system. f means forcibly delete all files on the system. And on root means start at the root level directory and then go down. So a sudo rm-rf on root, what that does, it deletes every single file and directory on the system. That's dangerous. That's that's obvious that that is dangerous. Most modern Linux distributions actually won't let you run that command. At least they won't let you run that command without jumping through an extra hoop or two, right? Because obviously it's going to brick the machine. But another common command that is a kind of a, a denial of service attack, a DOS attack, is the fork bomb. The fork bomb it is a shell script typically, but it could be written in any language. It could be you know, any uh, script or piece of code that you execute on the system. And what it does, it continually forks a process. So you start with one process and it forks itself into two processes. Then those fork themselves into two processes each, four processes, yada, 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 until you've got you know all of these processes on the system that keep forking themselves until your system runs out of memory and the machine locks up. Now again, a fork bomb can be written in any language. I found this repository over on GitHub, this fork bomb repository that this guy created where he's just collected, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 different fork bombs written in a variety of different languages. The most common one by far that people use, again, to take down Linux servers especially, is the shell script fork bomb, which You've probably seen people share this, this code right here, that line. If I entered that line in the terminal, what that will create a fork bomb that will start forking all of these processes, right, until the system completely locks up. So the shell fork bomb is really interesting because it's just these special characters, right? And if you didn't know shell scripting, you really wouldn't know what all of these special characters are actually doing. So let's actually explain this. So let me open up an Emacs buffer. And uh, let me zoom in. I'm on the wrong desktop here. Zoom way in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create this uh, example block here. And let's go ahead and paste the shell fork bomb. So if I entered this in a terminal, again, it would eventually lock up my machine. And then I would have to power off the machine. I'd have to physically power off the machine and restart the machine, reboot the machine to actually get the machine back to working. So the fork bomb really shouldn't do any uh, permanent damage to a machine, but still I wouldn't run it just for fun, not on a main like production workstation or something. If you want to test out the fork bomb, try it out in a virtual machine. A virtual machine, you can't really hurt anything. So the reason the fork bomb looks so weird in this example here is it's because it's all on one line. If I actually wrote this using uh, line breaks like you would if you were actually doing this as part of a shell script rather than how they have it on one line like you would enter it in a terminal, I think it would explain this much better. So if I did colon and then opening and closing parentheses and then I did an opening and closing brace and then let me space over a couple of times and I did colon pipe colon space and then the ampersand there and then let me do a uh, semicolon right there and then finally I want you to run colon so for those of you that are familiar at all with shell scripting, now it probably makes sense what this is doing. We are defining a function, right? So we actually defined a function here. We did a colon and then the opening and closing parentheses. We can name a function anything. So this should be function name, opening and closing parentheses. That's typically how you define a function in shell scripting. And they have decided to name this particular function colon. Why did they choose colon as the name of the function? Well, just to keep with the special character theme because it kind of obfuscates what's really going on here by using a colon as a function name. It's not obvious that that was a function there at the beginning, right? So colon, opening, closing parentheses is the name of the function, right? And then the braces here inside the braces is what the function actually does. What does the colon function do? Well, it runs colon, it runs itself, and then it pipes it 
into colon, <laughs> so it pipes it into itself, and then the ampersand means keep that process that you're currently running, running as a background process, so don't kill it, because typically when you run functions, they'll run, and then you'll run another function, and the previous function will kill itself, right? It, it basically, the new function replaces the old function, but here we want forks. We want each uh, process that gets created to continue to run, right? We don't want any of them to ever terminate themselves. And then we have the semicolon here. Now, the semicolon, because we're doing line breaks in a script, would not be necessary. It is necessary to have that semicolon if you're doing a single line, because that signifies, hey, you know, we've defined the function, and now colon, we're running the function. If you have a, a, doing all this on a single line, though, you need to add the semicolon, so there's a clear separator there. So that's the fork bomb explained. It's really, really simple what it's doing. It's not a complicated thing at all. And because it's not complicated, you know, I think more people should know what these things actually do. Another common fork bomb, if they don't do it in like POSIX shell script, sometimes they will do a bash specific fork bomb, which honestly is even simpler. Let me actually copy that. Let me get my Emacs uh, back because it would be easier once again to explain this using a little bigger font than what's in the browser. So this is the bash fork bomb. Now what is it actually doing? Well anybody that's ever executed a script knows you execute a script with dot slash, right? So what we're doing here is a dollar sign zero is the name of the script itself. So we want to do dot slash name of script. So run the script and then the pipe symbol. Meaning, okay, we're going to run the script and then we're going to pipe the script into dot slash dollar sign zero. So we're, that's the same thing as before. It's just written a little differently. Bash syntax is a little different than a POSIX compliant shell syntax. And then the ampersand, once again, keep that process running. So it just creates this infinite loop where you're constantly rerunning this script that's constantly running itself, piping itself into itself, and all these background processes just keep replicating until the system locks up. So that is the bash fork bomb, and that is the shell fork bomb. Those are the two most common that you'll see uh, if you check out this repository, and I'll link to this particular uh, fork bomb repository on GitHub so you guys can check the code for C, C++. Here's one for Haskell. Let's check this out, see if it's obvious what it's doing. Yeah, so it's importing... Uh, this library here forever and this library here a fork process fork process obviously it's going to take uh, a process and fork it right and you can see we're going to basically create this function here we're going to call it fork bomb and then what does it equal it equals this forever process i'm not sure what that does i'm assuming just make something run forever and then we run fork process on fork bomb itself so we're forking the fork bomb which is the function we're running, right? So it's basically the same thing. It's just a recursive kind of loop where we take a process, it runs itself, it forks itself, and nothing ever terminates, right? We keep all the running processes running and forking into eternity, essentially. So that's just a quick little look at the fork bomb. Really interesting small pieces of code that, again, I, I think it's educational to actually understand what some of these things are doing. I also think it's educational for you guys that see these things, especially that POSIX compliant shell fork bomb. You, you see that thing posted all over the Internet. I want you guys to be aware of what exactly that is so you don't accidentally enter that thing in a terminal and then wonder why your computer locks up. Now, before we go, I want to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. Episode. And of course, I'm talking about Gabe, James, Matt, Maxim, Mimit, Mitchell, Paul, West, Wanya, Bald, Homie, Alex, Armor, Dragon, Chuck, Commander, Ingeri, Dai, Yokai, George, Lee, Marstrom, Nader, Yan, Alexander, Paul, Peace, Arch, and Fedora, Polytech, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Steven, Tools, Devler, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode you just watched would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. Corporate sponsors sponsors they don't sponsor fork bombs right i depend on you guys the community so please check out distrotube over on patreon all right guys peace